Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Uh, today we're in the shop and we are making sugar bricks for the bees for the winter time. So it is around mid-November, late November, just a few days before Thanksgiving, which means that the bees now are beginning to cluster. The temperatures here in Kentucky have been dropping. They're, they're getting into the 30s and the 40s and at that temperature, those bees are gonna start to cluster for the winter time. And so did all the necessary preparations for winter, made sure that we got the mite loads down as low as possible by doing our Apigard, which is a thymol based treatment as well as oxalic acid mite treatments. Also made sure to get sugar syrup feed on those colonies. Again, I only run single, single brood management, single deeps within my apiary. So I made sure that each colony weighed at least 70 pounds of honey and syrup to get them through the winter time. However, you know, this, this season has been a little different in, in the sense that bees have been blowing through food stores. So we just haven't had a good flow. We, we basically had no fall flow around here and the bees were burning through those food stores, which can be a problem because they're going to need that to uh, feed on all through the winter time. So what we can do as beekeepers is supply emergency feed in the form of sugar patties or what I like to make, which is sugar bricks. And that's what I'm going to show you how to make today. So I use uh, Vivaldi boards. If you're not familiar with what a Vivaldi board is, I have other videos out there. Essentially, this is a quilt box. So if you go through some of my older videos, you'll find one I did on the amazing Vivaldi board where I kind of talk you through all the pros and cons of the Vivaldi board. But I really like using these. I've used them for several winters now. So one of the benefits of the Vivaldi board is these shims. So each Vivaldi board comes with a little square shim that's got number eight hardware cloth on it. And I think this is maybe inch, inch and a half all the way around. And essentially what this is, it's, it's, a, it's a shim that you can place inside the quilt box during the winter time, right above that, that hole in the inner cover there where the bees have access to emergency food. And that's what, let me grab this down here because this one's already dry. And that's what, that's what these are when you fill them full of sugar brick. So you can place these on the hive and it gives the bees access to emergency food if they need it. So how do we make, how do we make sugar bricks? Well, it's a pretty simple recipe. There's different variations out there depending on who you talk to and who you ask, different recipes. Uh, the one that I like is slightly modified based off of uh, Kent Williams' uh, recipe that I got from Chris at Dayton. And essentially, there's just a few ingredients. There's granulated sugar, there's water, apple cider vinegar, and it really doesn't matter what the brand is. You can get the cheap stuff from Kroger or Walmart. I just happen to have this. And Ultra B, I use Ultra B pollen substitute. So the pollen substitute is a bee's protein. Obviously, there's very little to no pollen available naturally right now. Everything's dying. It's, you know, we're getting into the winter time frame here in Kentucky. And then the sugar provides the energy that the bees need. Um, and the granulated sugar, the bees will need access to water in order to convert that into a usable form of syrup slash honey. And the bees, generally, we have enough warm days throughout here in Kentucky where the bees will be able to go out and forage on the water that they need. We just had a good rain here, so bees have been foraging on water, at least from the activity that I've seen. I presume that's what they're bringing in. So anyway, uh, pollen substitute, apple cider vinegar, granulated sugar, and water. And then essentially you just mix this all together and it forms almost the consist consistency of almost like a Play-Doh, but it, it doesn't bind as well as Play-Doh does. And so I'll tell you some tricks that I use uh, in putting this on the hive, but I'll go ahead and show you how I make a batch of this now. Okay, so to make the batch, the first thing that we need is the sugar. And so I have this 25 pound bag of sugar that has about 10 pounds left in it. So this recipe is for 10 pounds of granulated sugar. And all you really need is like a five gallon bucket or, or some, a, a big bucket to mix this in. I prefer the five gallon bucket because I'm also gonna use a drill and a paint stir, which works really great to be able to mix all this up. So you go ahead and dump your sugar in. Okay. 
Okay. Like I said, that's about 10 pounds of sugar. And then next we're gonna add our apple cider vinegar. Let's give it a good shake. And you're gonna put in a fourth of a cup of apple cider vinegar. All right. Now I go ahead and dry that out because I'm going to need this one fourth of a cup for the pollen substitute. So I dry that out. Open up the Ultra B pollen substitute. Get a fourth a cup. Sprinkle it in there. Okay. And now the only thing left is water. And it takes about two cups of water. And you want to use hot water. I need a little bit more water, bear with me. Okay, and that's it. And like I said, I use a drill. And you can get one of these cheap paint stirrers at a paint store, not that expensive. And if you got a cordless drill, this works great but I'll bring you in here and show you how to mix it up. Okay, we're ready to go ahead and mix here. Just start out slow so you don't splatter it everywhere. You could even start with the uh, slower setting on your drill. And what we're going for here is just a a complete mix, uh, even consistency. You want to make sure that you don't see any more of the white sugar, granulated sugar, by the time this is done. And this can take several minutes to get completely mixed. But by the time you're done, you shouldn't see any of the white sugar in there. It should all be this sort of off yellow color. So we'll go ahead and get this completely mixed. And when you're done, again, you should see, let me see if I can tilt it towards you here so you can see a little better. But again, it should be completely mixed in. You shouldn't see any of the white sugar anymore. It should all be yellow as that pollen substitute's been mixed throughout the entire batch here. So, all right, let's go ahead and put it inside the shims. Okay, now let's go ahead and add the sugar brick to the shims. So just reach in the bucket. Grab a handful, and like I said, this stuff kind of has the consistency of Play-Doh that isn't as, uh, I don't know, it, it doesn't stick together as well as Play-Doh, but it kind of has that similar consistency. So all you want to do, and, and you may not have these exact shims, if not, you can, you can actually place this directly on top of some newspaper right on top of the frames. There's lots of Good YouTube videos out there if you want to look that up of other beekeepers using that method. Uh, it works works well, works fine, nothing wrong with it. Uh, could have some challenges if you're using it with a quilt box, but again, it's all about bee spacing, proper bee spacing and all that. So with this particular shim, all I do is I, I press it into the square here, try to make sure I get it, you know, into the corners. And the main things you have to worry about is number one, try to try to press it together so that it, it, it will stick together a little bit, but it naturally wants to fall apart. And I'll show you when I get out into the apiary how I prevent that from happening so it doesn't just fall on top of the hive. So press it down as best that you can. And then I make a hole here in the middle 
because those Vivaldi boards have that inner circle hole that I showed you earlier. And you don't really want this sugar brick to fall down in that hole on top of the bees, on top of the cluster. So I'll make like this little hole in the center here and then just keep working it, keep pressing. And that hole doesn't have to be perfect. It's just, you really just want it such that it doesn't fall on top of the bees. And it also gives them a head start in terms of coming up here and access to the sugar brick. Plus the evaporation from their breath will pass through this hole and into the burlap sack that I lay on top of this. And again, I'll show you that when we get out to the yard. So that's it. The other thing you really need to be careful on and make sure that you pay attention to is you do not want this sugar brick to stand proud over these boards because you're going to lay this on top of the Vivaldi board. And so you want to make sure that you get down sideways and look at it and make sure that none of this brick is standing proud, which would prevent this shim from laying flat on top of the inner cover within the Vivaldi board. And that's really it. So we'll go ahead and get the rest of these filled. I've got 10 hives in the apiary currently that I'm trying to overwinter. So I've made, what my dad and I ended up doing is we ended up making extras of these shims. So I actually have empty shims on all of those colonies right now out in the yard. And all that's doing is just keeping the bees from being able to get up inside the quilt box, the Vivaldi board. So I've got this actually empty in the hive inverted and that hardware cloth is keeping the bees from getting up there and it's just a placeholder is the only reason i did that because i knew i was going to be making these sugar bricks and so i will go out there and i'll swap out that empty one for these that are full of food and so the reason that's the reason my dad and i made extra of these because the vivaldi board only comes with one of these shims so we made extras so that i could do exactly what i'm doing now which is come back to the shop fill up a bunch with food and get them ready and then I just have to go out into the yard and swap them out and this is also nice because throughout the entire winter now I can go out and check the colonies and I'll keep you guys posted as the winter progresses and show you how the bees are taking the food down or not again if the bees have access to their food stores the 70 pounds of syrup and honey that I diligently put on each hive this fall, then they may not touch this. I've had colonies go the entire winter and did not touch this sugar brick, but it is relatively cheap insurance, which is nice. So you know that at least your bees aren't going to starve. Now, you know, I was talking to a, our local EAS master beekeeper, Jake Cornell, master beekeeper as well. And he's, he's not a big fan of these sugar bricks, just putting them on uh, prophylactically, or I guess, you know, just as a preventative uh, measure before the, the bees actually need any food. Because th there is some downside to it. The, the bees' tongues are as soft as like a feather. And so when they come up here and they start taking this sugar down, this is somewhat hard sugar brick. Obviously it's a lot harder than natural nectar that they're used to slurping up. So it can somewhat damage the bees' tongues. Now those are gonna be your winter bees, and those are gonna be the bees that have to survive, you know, throughout the entire winter that are larger than your typical bees and uh, can live several months, all the way to even March or April. So the, the downside is if their tongues have been damaged, it can affect their ability to forage next spring. I personally have not seen this be a big issue, but you know, I also haven't you know, personally interviewed each fat bee and asked how their tongue was doing in the spring, so I have no evidence of knowing exactly how they were doing. I just didn't see any negative impacts from a colony's ability to forage come spring because you know that queen is really starting to lay and ramp up brood production late in the winter time. I'm talking February time frame. She's going to start ramping up to get ready for that spring flow. So seems like there's enough new bees being born that uh, bees can be converted for foraging purposes if by chance 
the, the existing bees have damaged their tongue to the point that they can't forage. Again, I personally have not seen that as an issue, but you know, when master beekeepers speak, I listen. So, so that's it. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get washed up and we'll take these shims out to the apiary and I'll show you how I install them in the hives. Okay, we're out here in the yard. Let's go ahead and put the first sugar brick on. Yeah, it's pretty chilly out here. It's in the low 40s, so the bees are definitely going to be clustering. We are certainly approaching winter here. Still technically in fall. Let's go ahead and see if we can see the cluster here. I use these burlaps. Yeah, there they are. It's like I was saying, and I don't want to keep this off the colony too long because I don't want to chill them. It's not, you know, freezing out here, but that heat is escaping. So like I said before, I had this empty shim in here just to prevent the bees from being able to get back up in there. And all, all you have to do, just give them a little bit of puff of smoke. And I got in a rush and lit this smoker with just leaves so because i knew i wasn't going to need much smoke so just give them a little bit of puff there try to get them back down you don't want them to break cluster that's for sure and then what i do to keep them from flying out which i really don't think they're going to do in this weather is i take a piece of paper because this sugar brick i've had it before where i turn it upside down and the brick just falls out which is like you know <laughs> not good <laughs> so what I've learned to do is I just take a couple sheets of paper and I put it on the bottom and then that keeps the sugar brick in place so when I invert this and set it on top of the colony then I go ahead and pull the paper out and that works pretty good so let's go ahead and get this done quickly so we're not we're not freezing them out here so go ahead and pull this one off which they've got it kind of propolis in here okay Pull that one off. Yep, see the cluster in there. And then what I do is just take this, invert it, stick it on there, just like that. And I'll take this piece of paper and pull it out from under. And that's another reason why I draw, I drew black permanent marker all around this. So I know that I'm centering this shim. Again, you could also just kind of eyeball it from here if you wanted to. But now the bees have access up into this emergency food. And within a day or two, you will see them up in here starting to chew this away. So I'm going to go ahead and close this colony back up. Because like I said, I don't want all their heat to escape. They work hard to generate it. So I just take the burlap, put it right back in there. And so they're, they're, the breath that they're, that, that they're exhaling, the evaporation from their breath will come up through that food and it will help soften that food and help them be able to break it down to a usable form of food. Instead of the granulated sugars, will be able to help them break it down. So. That's another benefit is with the heat rising and the evaporation from their breath coming up to the top, this burlap also helps wick away some of that moisture, but it'll keep the moisture, you know, around here. Depends on how big the colony is. I've had some massive colonies where this burlap gets moist all throughout here. So it really just depends on how big the colony is. But now they'll be able to come up and take this food and this burlap also having somewhat of an R factor by keeping the heat down will also help wick some of that moisture and help them to break that food down. So, and like I said, I use this Reflectix on top, which also helps keep that heat back down in the colony. But that's, that's really it. So go ahead and put the inner cover back on. And what I really like about this, you know, being an emergency form of food, 
I can come out here periodically throughout the winter time, open this up, take a peek, see it. It allows me to have a visual assessment of how much food this colony is taking down in terms of the sugar brick. If they're completely empty in the deep here and they're consuming the resource here, then I know at least they're not going to starve because I can gauge how much food they have left. The other benefit is, you know, when it gets cold enough, bees will not break, break cluster even to go find food. So if, if there's food on the outer frames here, one and 10, two and nine, but the cluster's here in the middle and there's no food next to them, if it's cold enough outside, they will not break cluster to go get that food and colonies will starve with food inside the hive because they will not chill that brood, they will not leave it alone at, just to go get the food. So, and I believe in really cold climates, you know, below freezing, bees only move about one millimeter a day. The cluster will only move very short distances. So the benefit of this also is that it's at the top of the colony where the heat is, it's in the middle. Generally speaking, in my experience, the bees don't have the issue of being able to get to food if they need it. Whereas if the food is in comb out here on one in 10, they may starve not being able to get to it. So that, that's really it. Hopefully this video has helped you. I'm, I'm curious, fellow beekeepers out there, what is your favorite sugar brick recipe? You know, uh, the one that I use, the apple cider vinegar is really used for a uh, preservative so that this brick doesn't get nasty over the several months that it may be on this colony. The other thing I forgot to mention is that this is a soft sugar brick recipe. If you want to have a harder brick, all you have to do is put these in the oven at a low temperature, 200 degrees ish for about an hour to hour and a half. And that will, when you take it out and you let it cool down, that sugar brick will harden. Now, again, the downside of that is like I was mentioning earlier in the video where the bees really have to use their tongues to break that down and with their tongues being like a feather it can damage their tongue so i personally don't like it i like to keep the bricks soft of course the downside of that is you have to use this little trick with a piece of paper like i was showing you to be able to prevent that brick from just falling all over in here or falling into the colony so which is again is why i put the little hole in the middle which works great for what i've used so i'm curious what the rest of you use in terms of a recipe and also what methods do you use to put your sugar brick in your colonies do you use shims do you put it directly on top of newspaper do you put it directly on top of the frames there's all sorts of different methods lots of ways to you know skin this proverbial cat out there in terms of providing emergency food for your colonies throughout the winter time so hopefully you found this video beneficial and you're able to use it for your own colonies. I've had really good success with this sugar brick over the, the years that I've used it throughout the winter time. I haven't had a colony starve on me through the winter. The one colony that I had starve on me this year was actually in late March, early April, and it was 100% my fault. I did not get out there and provide them additional feed, which is during the maximum time of starvation for a colony. So that was completely my bad. But if you use this method, uh, you know, I believe it works well, so I'm curious to hear your feedback. But if you like this video, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up for me, and I'll see you guys on the next one.